ahead and we will get started. Uh, the good news is the if there are people who uh, straggle in, uh, the only thing you'll really miss are uh, my remarks and the introductions, uh, and you'll get the substance. Uh, my name is Rod Smith. I direct the Center for Constitutional Studies, and I was not originally uh, assigned in any way to this panel, but we uh, lost a speaker toward the last, and uh, I am filling in, but I'm largely going to do it as a moderator, which will give us more time for questions, because I think we'll have serious questions raised during the course of what we're discussing. What we have here with RIFRA as we look forward, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, as we look forward, there's some very serious rights and interests in conflict. And I think, and we, one of the essays this morning by one of the students indicated this, is that it's very important that we respect those various interests. Uh, and what are some of the, the, the rights and interests? Well, you have the right of religious liberty. For those that were at the lunch, you would have seen some examples of that, of religious conscience. Uh, just, it, it's that sense that one's duty to her God re requires a certain activity. I think often in that regard of uh, a young basketball player that I knew in, when he was in high school. I would visit his family and he was going to a Catholic school and he was a very, very fine basketball player and he was the center of his team. He was six foot eight inches tall. And they were, had made their way to the semifinals of the state championship. Uh, and they were going to play on Sunday. And he, as a matter of faith, had never played on what was his Sabbath, Sunday. And so he, he announced that he was not going to be able to play. Uh, his, because they knew him, his teammates were disappointed, but supportive, even though it probably meant, and in fact did, that they were not going to win the, the game. Uh, he, uh, he also respected them. He didn't feel like he could use what talents he had because he thought in some measure they were a gift and they were something he'd worked for and he wasn't going to use it, that ability on Sunday. But he did uh, put on a sport coat and a tie and sat with his team and supported them on the bench. He tried to find a way to show his respect for them. And then at the end, at the banquet that year, they paid particular honor uh, to him, the priest that was the uh, supervised that the school uh, paid particular tribute to him and to his teammates who were willing to support him in that exercise, even at the expense of not proceeding in all likelihood to the state championship game. Now often that's true of religious liberty and it's true of so much of liberty, particularly if it's some kind of minority interest. The public largely doesn't understand, and you have to, it, 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 and there's going to be repercussions. But you pay a price when you exercise rights many times. Well, implicated in these cases as well are women's rights. Uh, a number of the cases have dealt with contraceptives and other kinds of issues and whether businesses would supply those contraceptives or uh, abortifacients. Or, uh, and uh, the, pe the people on the religious side say, oh, you can't do this because it violates 
our duty to God and to humanity. But by the same token, women and their right to choose, which is a very significant right. I, I, I would always, when I would teach Roe versus Wade, have students say, well, I'd have some students say, well, where's that right? come from. And I said it's in the Ninth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, I particularly like the Fourth Amendment, that you can't have a search a seizure. They couldn't even come in the curtilage, couldn't even come into somebody's property, and yet we're going to say that the government can come in and tell a woman how she's going to use her body. So it's a very significant interest. And I learned it probably most emphatically when I started teaching. I was, uh, I was the faculty advisor to the Right to Life group. And I wore a little pin of two little tiny feet. And I wore it to work one day. And my dear friend and colleague, Marshall Kelly, took me aside and said, Rod, would you, as a favor to me, take the pin off? And then she proceeded to tell me a very heart-wrenching experience that she had. And that every time she looked at that, it enhanced her pain. I took off the pin, but the quid pro quo for that was the two of us went on public radio and had a very serious discussion about the issue itself and a respectful one. She'd always been reluctant to do that, as so many are today, because there's, when you get to the fringe, it's an all or nothing game always. Then on the LGBTQ rights, they're very serious. I was hired not long ago, not here, but at another institution for a job. One of the faculty members who opposed my being hired asked to meet with me afterwards. And uh, he is a wonderful gay man. And he explained to me that he had lost the love of his life, his partner. He had sat there while he died of AIDS. And he saw me as an affront. We talked for an hour and a half that day. I tried to embrace at the end. He didn't, couldn't. He said, not now. But Ben and I are best of friends now. We do embrace. We do respect one another. So, and then there are governmental interests that will come into conflict. And then we're going to have a conflict. Well, what about if it's a private Right, somebody doing it privately. They're going to throw a party and tell someone, some group they're not going to be able to come, but it's a private party at their home. That's one level. But what if you're in the marketplace? And there are laws that regulate the marketplace, anti-discrimination and other laws. What do you do in that context? How far does the freedom, it's all of this is sort of a continuum. And then on the other side, on the other end of uh, that convention, you, you have pure government sorts of activities that are clearly uh, that are government. And uh, then also, law, uh, there, there's another continuum I want to introduce, and then I'm going to introduce the speakers. Just that it's, uh, here's the continuum. Friends and kindness, respect, toleration, marginalization, disdain, and enemies. Think of that continuum. My friend Sandy Levinson, I was once able to give a tribute to him, and my tribute was, what would the Constitution look like among friends? He was a... Uh, culturally uh, 
and his family was very Jewish, and he grew up in North Carolina. But he always indicated that he appreciated his friends, that his friends cared enough about him that they would share their beliefs. And that they also cared enough about him that when he didn't accept the beliefs, they still respected him and they remained friends. Friends, that side. Well, frankly, the law is not very good at promoting friendship. Then the next over is respect. Uh, the law can and should do that, is find ways, and we as a people should find ways to show respect for those views with which, particularly those we disagree with. Uh, Professor Scott this morning was terrific in his presentation uh, with the essay at saying one of the things we as scholars seek to do is make sure that all sides are discussed so that we can make some kind of wise resolution as respectful and fair as it can be. Then you've got toleration. As I said this morning, I don't care much for toleration. It's a 17th century concept. Toleration means I'm better than you, but I'll tolerate you. That's not respect. Then next is marginalize, and we see much of that today. If we disagree, that's what goes on in the media all the time. If we disagree with someone, we marginalize them. We don't look at them. We, we just search for the people that say what we believe in, and then we marginalize them. And sadly, that marginalization sometimes turns to disdain and even sometimes hatred. And we cannot, in my view, long survive as a nation with that. Well, those very kinds of interests come into conflict uh, in this area. And uh, so I just can't think of uh, 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 two better people to help us wrestle with this kind of conflict. What do you do when the, when the, when someone's Religious liberty, right? Let, the cake maker is serious. He's sincere. He believes that. He's losing a lot of business. He is facing a backlash for his belief. That's real. That gay couple that has been kicked and beat upon so much also It, it's like it, any one of us, if we walked into a business and they said, I don't want to serve you, and said it for a very personal reason. These are real tensions. And we, as a people, must be equal to this. Do, does everyone, did everyone get a copy of the program so they can, do, do you, I, okay, no, so then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the academic side of our final two speakers. I, then I'll say a little personally. Uh, to my uh, far left. Which uh, is probably accurate. Uh, <laughs> to my near left would be, uh, but, but to my far left today is uh, uh, my dear friend, Fred Geddes. Uh, you're not supposed to say this in these kinds of settings, but I love Fred. He's as good a friend as I have. And I love to disagree with Fred. And nine times out of 10, he persuades me. But one time out of 10, I might be right. <laughs> and Fred uh, grew up in New Jersey in Southern California. He got an economics degree at BYU and earned a law degree at the University of Southern California. He clerked on the Ninth Circuit, a prestigious clerkship. He then practiced corporate and securities law with probably the best firm in Phoenix. I know that having taught at ASU's law school. He joined the BYU Law School uh, faculty in 1990 uh, with a little bit of arm wrestling. Uh, Fred is perfect for BYU's law school. He needs to be at BYU's law school. He, causes people to think about things they'd never thought about before and think about it in a way, and always he does it respectfully. Uh, and 
He's done much in the church state area. He's uh, joined with other scholars in uh, briefs on cases like Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. That was one we were on the opposite sides on. It happens. Uh, and uh, he, he's uh, written a wonderful book on the rhetoric of church and state, a critical analysis of religion and uh, religion clause jurisprudence at, at Duke University Press. And then uh, Alexander Dushku is a partner, a member of the board of directors of the Salt Lake City law firm of Curtin and McConkie, a firm I respect greatly. Uh, he graduated uh, with honors from BYU's uh, law school in 1993. I think he had Fred as a, may have had Fred as a professor. Absolutely. Another chance for you to try and persuade Fred. Uh, and then, uh, it, uh, so he joined the Curtin and McConkie firm in 1996. He was the primary, he, he, he is a renowned advocate and well-deserved in the religious liberty area. I don't know that we have anyone more qualified than he is in the state of Utah. So it's great to have Alexander with us. Uh, and uh, as an evidence of sort of the medal of the man, one of the things he's wrestled just like I have and just like Fred does and just like we will together with how a, in the world can we, if possible, reach a compromise? He was instrumental in the Utah Compromise, played a major role in trying to balance these rights by first respecting and then say, is there a way we can do this well? So, we'll hear first from Alexander, then we will hear from Fred, and then we will open it up for questions. Alexander. Well, thank you, Rob, for that, that introduction. That's a huge introduction that sort of covers you know, the whole breadth and width of, uh, of the conflicts that exist when you're talking about religious freedom. And uh, I'm grateful to be here with Professor Fred Geddix. Uh, he and I, I just remembered this, he and I started BYU Law School um, together in the sense that you arrived as a professor the year I arrived as a, as a first year law student. He was a great, uh, great mentor uh, to me. Caused me to think critically and caused me uh, to challenge assumptions that uh, I'd held for many, many years and in some cases to move on from those assumptions and frankly some cases to deepen those assumptions and to strengthen them with, with greater reasons. Um, I hope your education is doing that for you. Uh, just because you're challenged, that doesn't mean you have to abandon something you believe in. But it does mean you ought to, you ought to dig, dig a little deeper and figure out uh, the reasons why. And there may be reasons uh, to change some of those beliefs and understandings. There is no way to even begin to address all of the topics that, that Rod has teed up, um, they, are, um, they are profound and there are, there are many, many challenges uh, that relate to religious freedom. Let me just make one broad comment though. <clears throat> religious freedom is always controversial. You don't need religious freedom unless someone might try to attack your religious freedom. You don't need a First Amendment to protect something that is already profoundly and deeply protected within a culture and never again is going to face any kind of risk. So to the extent that you hear about controversies in the context of religious freedom, uh, that's okay. That's not a crisis. That's the system. And you should always expect that religious freedom will have a degree of controversy uh, attached to it. There's nothing new there. I'm going to talk about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act a little bit. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have actually heard of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act? 
so many. Um, if you had to characterize your understanding as uh, either you know really, really good or kind of medium or not very good at all, how many of you would characterize your understanding as really, really good? This isn't, I'm, I'm just trying to understand my audience a little bit. So a few of you kind of in the middle, understand a little bit about it, but not that much. And maybe the rest of you don't understand much, but be interested in maybe learning a little bit more. Does that characterize a bunch of you? Okay. So that's helpful. Uh, Our subject is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, and the law, at least that's how I understood uh, our topic. And I've entitled my remarks, From Consensus to Controversy, RIFRA, which is the shorthand name for the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and the Decline of an American Ideal. Um, here's my thesis. Um, however much it may have been honored in the breach, Belief in the vital importance of robust religious freedom has been part of the American constitutional narrative and tradition for centuries, but that is starting to change. In 2011, Professor Douglas Laycock wrote, quote, for the first time in nearly 300 years, important forces in American society are questioning the free exercise of religion in principle, suggesting that free exercise of religion may be a bad idea or at least a right to be minimized, end quote. And I think it's fair, it's fair to say that the concerns that he had back in 2011 have only gotten worse since. And nowhere is this more true than where religious freedom seems to stand in the way of full enforcement and recognition and validation of the ongoing cultural, social, and legal revolution regarding the topics of marriage, family, gender, and sexuality. Those are the topics that you're aware of that generate controversies. As a consequence of these controversies, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is now a point of ferocious uh, controversy. But it didn't start out that way. So I want to tell you a little bit about RIFRA and how it, how it started out. Um, there was, there was a Supreme Court case in 1990, just as I was entering law school. It was called Employment Division Against Smith. This is, the, this is the Native American peyote case. Anyone heard of that before? The peyote smoking case. Okay. Here's what happened. It involved, the case involved two members of the Native American church who were fired from their jobs as counselors at a private drug rehabilitation clinic for ingesting peyote as part of their religious ceremonies. Now, peyote is a hallucinogenic drug, and it's illegal under Oregon law, and there's no exception for religious use. Well, they applied to the state for unemployment compensation, but they were denied because peyote use amounted to a termination for misconduct. And if you're terminated for misconduct, you don't get uh, unemployment compensation. So what they did was they sued the state of Oregon, and they claimed that the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, that piece of the First Amendment which protects the exercise of religion, uh, was violated by this rule that the state of Oregon had. They went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rejected their claims. <clears throat> um, the Supreme Court held that you can't have, under the religion clauses of the First Amendment, you don't get any kind of exemption from a general law that applies to everyone that's not targeted at religion, just because it happens to place a burden upon your religious exercise. Now, what the court said in doing that is we're not going to engage in any kind of balancing. We're not going to try to figure out how important this is to the religious person or how important the interest is to the government. We're not going to try to balance it out to see whether Oregon really, really cares about peyote use or just cares a little bit and how important this might be to these Native American um, men who were, who were terminated. That decision not to engage in any kind of a balancing was a departure, a sudden departure from how things had been done in the Supreme Court for the prior 30 years. And it was very controversial. Um, previous to that, the Supreme Court had required that these kinds of claims be balanced. And what, what the Supreme Court had said was that if, if the government has a very important interest, a compelling interest, 
And if it pursues that interest very carefully, so as not to burden your religious freedom um, too much, then it can impose on your religious freedom. But if it doesn't have that, then it can't. Now that was a really hard standard uh, for the government to overcome, at least in theory. Well, the Supreme Court, without any briefing, totally by surprise, threw that test out. It was called the compelling interest test. It got rid of it in that decision of employment division uh, against Smith. Um, what, that, what that standard captured was an ideal. The ideal was that government and thus society should accommodate the exercise of religion unless it has extremely good reasons why it can't. That was an ideal. And the Supreme Court essentially set that aside, at least for its own test. And there was a lot of scholarly commentary at the time about this, and people were shocked. And there were a lot of very, very critical law review articles and other um, scholarly treatments that really criticized the US Supreme Court. And very quickly, a consensus developed in Congress that something had to be done to try to overturn this, or at least to restore the religious freedom that had existed prior to this Smith decision. And that something was the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. And it was supported by all kinds of groups, from the ideological left, like the ACLU, to the ideological far right, like the evangelical prison ministry groups, and all kinds of groups in the middle, churches and charitable organizations, Jewish groups, Muslim groups, um, Christian groups, every group you can imagine. It was an enormous moment of consensus. And what, and what RIFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, purported to restore was that old standard that the Supreme Court had just gotten rid of. Now, most people didn't understand the technicalities of what, <clears throat> of what they were voting for, uh, of course. Um, but they did understand that this would be affording very strong protection for religious freedom. This passed almost unanimously in Congress. I think it was unanimous in the House of Representatives and maybe just a couple votes um, shy of unanimous in the United States Senate. President Clinton signed it. It was one of these great bipartisan moments which many of you students have never seen before in your entire lives. <laughs> it was one of those moments where people came together, left, right, and center. But within five years, that consensus had evaporated, at least with respect to certain areas of religious freedom. In 1997, the Supreme Court issued a decision that said that this Religious Freedom Restoration Act didn't apply to state governments. So if the state government was coming after you to harm your religion, it, the Supreme Court held that Congress didn't have the power to impose that standard, that protection on state governments. And that created a little bit of a crisis. Congress wanted to fix that, and some efforts were made um, to try to do that. And what that meant was, that what that decision meant was that the, only the federal government um, was uh, under this RIFRA standard, okay? So if you, if you were being attacked by the federal government in some way, you had strong religious freedom protections, but in many states, you didn't, because RIFRA was held not to apply to the states. So Congress sought to fix that, um, but by the time it tried to do that, in 1998, the consensus and the coalition had fallen apart. So what happened to make that coalition fall apart? Well, according to Pre Professor Laycock, who was in the middle of both legislative efforts, um, here's what he writes about it. He says, the most important thing that happened between 1993 and 1998 was a series of lawsuits against small landlords who refused to rent apartments to unmarried same-sex couples. The couples alleged marital status discrimination. The landlords defended on the basis of religious liberty. And in one case, the landlord won. In the other case, um, in the most famous of these, the, uh, uh, the landlord lost. Everyone understood that if religious landlords had a defense to marital status discrimination, they would also have a defense to sexual orientation discrimination. This litigation galvanized the gay rights movement. Gay groups organized the entire civil rights movement to oppose this new act that was going to fix the old act. They wanted a global exception for any civil rights claim. In other words, the RIFRA coalition broke apart over issues of sexuality and LGBT rights. 
the opponents of RIFRA's standard wanted an express exemption for civil rights laws, to say basically that religious freedom protections don't apply in the context of civil rights laws. While defenders of RIFRA argued that there was no exemption needed because RIFRA itself contained a test that would balance things out and that sometimes the one side would win, sometimes the other side would win, depending on the facts of the case, but that there was no need to have a total carve-out just because something was labeled a civil rights law. Um, Congress couldn't agree, and you had this deep fracture that occurred in Congress, and the result was that RIFRA was not amended to apply to the states, but it remains applicable to the federal government. And as a result, uh, RIFRA has gone from being uh, something of great consensus to something that has become extremely controversial. Now, what has happened since has been something of, um, at least in some quarters, a war of attrition against RIFRA and another land use statute that has RIFRA's standards, uh, RIFRA's constitutional standard in it. In it. It's called the Religious um, Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, RELUPA. There'll be a test on that afterward. Um, it basically protects, when you, when you want to go build a church, it protects you from local land use regulations that unfairly prevent you from, uh, from building a church. Um, so there's been, there's been a, a little bit of a war of attrition against RIFRA. Um, theories and arguments that have sought to, um, to, to narrow RIFRA's application, to, you know, to trim it back. Congress can't repeal RIFRA because um, the, the kind of pro-religious freedom piece of Congress uh, won't allow it to be uh, repealed and, and those who uh, would like to amend it don't have uh, the power uh, to do so. Um, so what are some of these, these arguments that are being used to, to chip away at, uh, at RIFRA? I want to mention just a few of them, um, not necessarily in any particular order. You may have heard uh, one or two of these and some are more technical. And Professor Geddix is, is going to get into one area that, uh, that touches on this. But here's an argument. RIFRA only protects individuals, not corporations. So the text of RIFRA applies, to, applies its protections to persons. And some have argued that the term person can't apply uh, to corporations. Now this argument kind of makes intuitive sense initially until you realize that the term person is a term of art. And in federal law, uh, elsewhere in federal law, in the Dictionary Act, they define the word person to mean not only individuals, but also corporate entities, legal entities, and so forth. That's fairly standard throughout federal law. Um, second, there's no question that RIFRA and the First Amendment um, were intended to protect churches and other religious organizations, which are most often organized as corporations. They organize as corporations so that they can own property, so they can engage in contracts, build buildings, and do things like that. So it couldn't have been the case that, that Congress didn't intend to protect uh, churches and other uh, entities that organize themselves as, as corporations. And third and more broadly, even though there's some kind of an, an intuitive appeal to the notion that only people exercise constitutional rights, never corporations. That's actually not true. It's not true at all. Um, the New York Times Corporation, for example, is a corporation. It's a for-profit corporation. If the government sought to compel the New York Times to print an editorial, would they be denied a First Amendment, free speech, freedom of the press right to say, no, government can't force us to, uh, to publish an editorial? Well, of course not. If the Pentagon tried to force Sony Pictures to produce pro-war propaganda, would Sony Pictures not have the right to uh, defend against that uh, under the First Amendment? Well, of course it would. And so uh, no one really argues that corporations have no constitutional rights. And the Supreme Court rejected this argument in the Hobby Lobby case, which, uh, which dealt with uh, the contraception issue that, uh, that Rod mentioned. So second, there's, there's another argument out there, and that is that that it's the notion that the substantial burden on religious exercise means that, that the religious exercise needs to be impossible. Now, what did I just say? In RIFRA, there's a, there's a little threshold. If you want to claim that your religious freedom has been abridged by the government, 
you have to first show that that it wasn't just a small abridgment, some small little thing that was just an annoyance of having to live in an organized society. You have to show that it was some substantial thing, that it really did matter to you. Well, there have been plenty of efforts over the years to try to, to raise that bar and make it really, really hard, not just to show that something has burdened you, but, but, that, but that a government regulation has made it almost impossible for you to exercise your religion. Let me give you one example. Uh, in the companion law to, to RIFRA, which protects religious land use, uh, you have to show that a local land use regulation prohibiting you from, from building a church uh, substantially burdens your, your religion. Well, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, one of the courts that's just below the Supreme Court, uh, held that as long as a church could build somewhere in the city of Chicago, that there wasn't a substantial burden on its religion. Well, Chicago's huge, and churches are often local community churches. And so what they did was they raised that standard so high that the, the church could never get, uh, never get to the, the protections that that law provided. So that's been an area that's been a concern, um, trying to raise the substantial burden, that initial threshold, uh, too high. Um, now, to be sure, there are challenges with defining substantial burden. I think Professor Geddes is going to talk about that, and, and there, are, uh, there are challenges. Not everything can be a substantial burden on religious freedom, such that you bring in these huge constitutional uh, guns that, that defend you. Otherwise, society wouldn't work. But that doesn't mean that it should be so severe that you couldn't possibly practice your religion. Um, another line of attack has been the notion of third-party harm. So this is the idea that you can't have religious freedom protections under RIFRA or even under the First Amendment um, if the exercise of religion imposes a harm on another person. Now, as a general idea, this makes sense, right? It's certainly true that your religious liberty doesn't include the right to punch me in the nose or to sacrifice me to bail against my will. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Nor does it include the right to confiscate my property or to take my personal possessions to fund your religious works, even if you're giving them to the poor. No one argues otherwise. But the no third party harm argument that some make goes even further than this. Um, what if the notion of harm was super, super broad? For example, suppose the government passed a new law saying that you personally have to send a check each month to an abortion clinic or to a paramilitary group fighting in a civil war? What if that were the law? And what if you reject it on religious liberty grounds, saying, I can't do that. My conscience doesn't allow me to do one or the other or both of those. Um, should it be enough for the government simply to say that you automatically lose because without that check that you've now been mandated to send in, someone might not be able to obtain an abortion or the paramilitary group might not have enough food or ammunition to carry out its activity? Well, that wouldn't make much sense. Or what, if we're, or what if the harm were defined to mean any kind of offense to another's dignity? Should that be enough to defeat a religious liberty claim? We live in a society where there's lots of robust debate. Americans have been known for forever for having debates that are sometimes ferocious. And giving offense and taking offense, is that enough to wipe out a constitutional right because somebody feels harmed by that? So the truth is that if harm is broadly defined in this way, um, it could wipe out many religious liberty claims, from the absolute right of a church to choose its own ministers, which sometimes may harm the person who was not chosen to be the minister, to the right of street preachers to use harsh language to call people to repentance, which sometimes harms the sensibilities of passers-by. Um, and remember, those kinds of limitations typically aren't applied at least not in their very, very broad way, not in the very broad way to uh, other types of constitutional rights. And in any event, constitutional protections for religious freedom have typically taken those kinds of harms into account. They're part of the balancing. Who's getting hurt? What, is the relative in, what are the relative interests and who ought to prevail? So finally, um, there's, a, there's another broad notion that is becoming a threat to religious freedom uh, generally and also to, uh, to RIFRA in particular. 
And that's the notion that religious freedom should primarily be an equality or non-discrimination right rather than a substantive bar on state intrusion. Now, what does that mean? Um, there are those who argue that really what religious freedom is about is not being discriminated against because you're Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or Mormon or whatever. Uh, but that as long as you're not being discriminated against, you don't have any particular right to an accommodation to address your particular uh, religious needs, certainly uh, not by the government. Um, that would be a significant narrowing of the way that we have thought about religious freedom um, for many, many decades. Um, the, the right to have government accommodate us when our conscience is severely impacted, when our deepest loyalties to God are challenged, is, is a precious right. We can't always be accommodated, but often we can be. And just as accommodations are made in other areas, a number of which that, that Rod mentioned, um, in other areas of our lives where there are important interests, whether it be in the interest of, of reproductive choice or in the interest of other areas of our lives, there should be, in my view, a substantive right, an affirmative right, to be accommodated by government, where the government does not have a, a sufficiently powerful reason for denying that accommodation. So in conclusion, um, even though RIFRA passed and has remained in place for 25 years, and even though this is a country that respects religious freedom, there are significant cracks that are starting to appear uh, in the edifice of uh, religious freedom, certainly at the level of a public commitment to the notion that people should not be compelled against their conscience to do things that their religion prohibits. Um, the, the major forces that are pushing this uh, are, for the moment, um, pieces of the sexual revolution. There's no question about that. And there are absolutely legitimate claims by LGBT people to, to protection and to rights of equal citizenship. But in affording those protections and in accommodating those important interests, just as we will accommodate other important interests in the years and decades to come, we must not allow the precious right of religious freedom to go by the wayside. Thank you. very pleased to be here. I, I told Rod um, that I'm always glad to come, although I always get lost when I come. Uh, I can never find a place to park. And then, um, I mean, your campus is awesome, but it's sort of laid out like that maze in the Harry Potter movie, where sometimes I think even the hallways are moving. And uh, as I was trying to find my way to lunch, I actually passed Taco Bell three times. And uh, after a while, I realized it was probably the only Taco Bell on campus, and then I really was turned around. Um, I, I'm very pleased that, um, uh, that Rod asked me to uh, come and talk to you here today. He is an old friend and uh, one of my most generous friends, as you can tell from that introduction. And I'm glad to be on the, the panel with Alexander who was such a good student and, and does such important work on religious liberty. I, I, I do want to just depart from, just for a moment, from the, um, from the theme because of something uh, Alexander said. Um, you know, the greatest compliment I think one can give to a teacher is that the teacher has caused the student to think more deeply and carefully about an issue, and that's irrespective of whether the student changes his or her mind. And so I took that as a compliment from Alexander and wanted to underline something for you all because you're here as students and you're um, uh, pursuing your education. There's a tendency among universities today, including some of our best universities, for students to decide that there are certain things they don't want to hear. Um, or certain things they shouldn't be expected to hear and requiring them to hear things 
with which they disagree is actually an affront. And this is true on both the right and the left. Uh, I enjoy uh, reading the New York Times. Uh, I have a subscription. Uh, I voted for George McGovern in 1972. I'm still proud of that. Uh, but I also read the Wall Street Journal, and I don't enjoy reading the Wall Street Journal as much, especially the editorial page, because it's challenging. Um, I hardly ever agree with an editorial in the Wall Street Journal, but it's good for all of us to realize that there are reasonable people who hold different views than we do. Um, and I worry um, for both liberals and conservatives that, that social media and other aspects of contemporary society have allowed us to create our own little ideological bubbles in which we can insulate ourselves. And in fact, in which we claim an entitlement to insulate ourselves from those who disagree with us. And I think, um, I think that's a very unfortunate development. So, okay, with that lecture over with now, uh, I will say a few words uh, about REFRA. Uh, I've titled my remarks today, um, Exemptions on Demand. <clears throat> now, I don't think that's true of all exemptions under REFRA, but uh, I think that the Supreme Court in its interpretation of this statute which I still generally support and which I think is an important protection for religious freedom. Um, I think the court has uh, taken a left turn into a, into a cul-de-sac, uh, 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 out of which there aren't any easy exits. So if you, uh, Alexander has mentioned some of these things, um, uh, Hannah Clayson Smith, Smith mentioned them uh, in her, uh, uh, really excellent lunch and talk today. But uh, if you're going to make a claim under REFRA, a claim for exemption, you have to prove, you have to allege and prove three things. You have to prove, um, you have to identify a religious act or an exercise or sometimes even just a belief. And you have to show that you as the claimant are sincerely obligated to observe as a matter of belief um, you know, this religious precept, however it's described as an act or an exercise. And then finally, you have to show that um, a federal law or some other act of the United States substantially burdens this act or exercise or a belief. And then if you prove those three things, the burden shifts to the government. And the government is then obligated um, to show that the burden it's imposing on you is justified. Uh, and it does that by proving two things. First, that the goal it's pursuing is exceptionally important, a compelling governmental interest. Now, there's, there's a whole range of things that qualify as a, as a compelling interest, but two classic examples that run through the law are national security, national defense, and the protection of children. Those are, those are interests that are virtually always found to be compelling. And then the government has to show that there is no other way, that is no way to protect these compelling interests other than burdening uh, the religious practice of the claimant. And if the government can prove those two things, then the government will win. Um, so all of that's pretty straightforward and has been the law for quite a while. Um, there is a line of Supreme Court cases which uh, Ms. Smith adverted to at lunch uh, called the religious question cases. And these are questions with, which hold, I, I think correctly, that uh, secular courts in the United States, federal or state, are absolutely deprived of the power to make theological judgments. Um, these cases uh, arose during uh, Civil War and Reconstruction. A lot of uh, Protestant churches split during that era over the issue of slavery and then the issue of civil rights for the newly freed slaves. And some of them believe that uh, uh, that racial subordination was divinely ordained by God and that um, 
Uh, they did not want to support the new regime, and others of the congregation uh, disagreed. And so then they started fighting about the property and the checking accounts or the, uh, uh, the assets of the church. And often they would go to a court and, and say and ask, you need to decide which of us is the true congregation, which of us has been most faithful to the religion, because that would be the entity that's entitled to the, the church building and the assets and everything else. And the court, uh, very consistently since um, the early 1870s, has held that courts lack that power, that the Establishment Clause prohibits them absolutely from deciding these kinds of questions. Now, in the Hobby Lobby case, uh, the Supreme Court seemed to apply the religious question doctrine to the substantial burden element of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, so the court seemed to say this. It seemed to say that courts were prohibited from deciding both whether a federal law burdens religion and whether that burden is substantial. And of course, a claimant has to prove both those things. But if federal courts can't review the allegations of the claimant, then the claimant can, can basically establish the sub substantial burden element just by raising his or her hand. You make the allegation, the court says that's not substantial, uh, the claimant says, you can't make that decision. It's my decision as a believer to decide whether or not the burden is substantial. And that's that. Um, so, uh, what happens next? Well, on the back end, as Alexander talked about, and as Ms. Smith talked about at lunch, there's the compelling interest test, uh, which I just related. Uh, a very strict test, in fact, called strict scrutiny. And uh, that phrase uh, points to the idea that in certain circumstances, courts have to give a very searching and skeptical examination of government justifications for uh, the laws and the other things that it's doing. So you could always, um, I suppose, uh, once someone has alleged a substantial burden, and if the court can't review the substantiality or even the existence of that burden, well, you can say, well, no worries. Um, if the government has a really important reason, um, you know, then it will be able to persuade the court that uh, its law is justified, um, even though it's a substantial burden on religion. Um, but as the court mentioned several times in Hobby Lobby, as Ms. Smith mentioned today, the compelling interest test, strict scrutiny, is the most challenging standard in constitutional law, the most stringent standard in constitutional law. Governments uh, usually cannot meet that standard. So in other areas of constitutional law, under the Equal Protection Clause, for example, when the government is required to justify a, a racial classification under strict scrutiny or other kinds of discrimination, uh, it fails more than 80% of the time. Uh, under freedom of speech and other fundamental rights cases, when the government is required to justify a burden on speech, it fails more than 70% of the time. So, you know, 20, 30 percent, that's not nothing, but, um, but 70, 80 percent, those are big numbers. And that means that we really can't rely on the compelling interest test and strict scrutiny to provide a limiting principle for circumstances in which uh, a claimant ha uh, wants to be exempt from a religiously neutral and generally applicable law and uh, courts are unable to review whether, in fact, that person qualifies for that exemption uh, on the basis of one of REFRA's textual, textual requirements, which is that the burden be, uh, number one, real, and number two, uh, substantial. Um, so if claims of substantial burden are not reviewable by courts, 
And if government usually fails to satisfy the compelling interest test, what limiting principle might exist? Well, a number of scholars uh, have suggested sincerity, that really uh, the way to go after this is to go after, um, is to closely examine the sincerity of the claimant. And again, Ms. Smith this morning, the, the example she gave uh, uh, to reassure everybody that, um, that REFRA would not uh, uh, be claimed in an excessive number or in unreasonable, uh, in unreasonable circumstances. I, I actually uh, don't agree that this was the case to give that assurance. But she suggested uh, one of the many Church of Marijuana or Church of Opioids or, you know, people have done this forever, uh, trying to cloak their drug, tra drug trafficking operations in religion. Uh, so, sure, a court can look at that and say, you know, um, I don't think this is a religion. Uh, I think this is a convenient way for you to operate uh, a criminal enterprise, and uh, you're not going to be able to, to fool us with that. But not all sincerity cases are that easy. In fact, most of them uh, are not easy at all. I think government challenges to sincerity uh, would be bad for religion and bad for believers. Um, first of all, uh, if the government is challenging someone's sincerity, they have to prove that the person doesn't really believe what they say they believe. Um, the government almost never chooses this tactic because it is such a bad look. There is no better way to create sympathy for a religious claimant than to put them on the stand and start cross-examining them on their religious belief like they're before the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, you go through all the cases, the government hardly ever challenges sincerity, even in circumstances in which there's a case for it, and, and I'll mention one of those uh, in a moment. But as I said, I think government challenges are bad for believers and for religion as well. Uh, religious beliefs, I think, almost by definition, are not rational. Um, I mean, think about it. Um, the central claim of Christianity is that a man voluntarily gave up his life and then brought himself back to life. Um, that just doesn't make any sense. There's no rational account of how that could happen, let alone whether it did actually happen with Jesus of Nazareth. And there are so many other examples. Uh, the real presence in the, um, uh, in the Catholic Mass and the host, the Jewish Kashrut and the Muslim Halal laws, um, all the miraculous accounts of protection uh, by uh, religion or Mormon temple garments or blessings or things like that. Those are things for which we have no rational account. None of them make any reasonable sense. And this is always what sincerity comes down to. When the government examines sincerity, whether it says this or not, the underlying question always is, could a reasonable person really believe something like this? Now, in a Christian country like ours, um, that is a country in which um, the culture is Christian, and most people, the majority are Christian, we're all familiar with the story of Jesus and the story of the resurrection. Doesn't sound, doesn't sound bizarre at all uh, to talk about the resurrection of Jesus because it's simply familiar. But if uh, we were somewhere else, um, somewhere in which Christianity were a small minority, then that story would sound bizarre. And things that sound bizarre to us, things we might draw from, from Islam, or from pagan religions, um, there are places in which those things are entirely normal. Um, sincerity inquiries prejudice minority religions because their beliefs are unfamiliar and they're less likely to have a veneer uh, of reasonability. But I think uh, sincerity inquiries also prejudice majority uh, and culturally entrenched religions. 
Now, let me give you the example of a difficult uh, sincerity inquiry, which I think will illustrate uh, the point I'm trying to make. There actually was a very strong basis for challenging sincerity in the Hobby Lobby case. Um, the Green family, the, the family that still owns all the Hobby Lobby stores, um, their uh, employee health plan had covered IUDs and morning after pills for years, despite the family's claimed beliefs um, that these are abortifacients whose use violates their beliefs about taking human life. Um, and in fact, the Wall Street Journal, so not the New York Times, not fake news, but uh, the Wall Street Journal reports that the Green family was completely unaware of this until um, the Beckett Fund called them up and said, hey, would you like to be a plaintiff in our lawsuit um, because uh, uh, the federal government is going to force you to cover uh, emergency contraception? And they said, yes, we would like to be a plaintiff in that lawsuit. And then, whoops, we're already covering uh, emergency contraception. Okay. So if you're a government lawyer and you want to put out, pull out all the stops on sincerity, I mean, what would you do? So you would ask for a production order. You'd ask um, Hobby Lobby to produce, um, or the Green family as the owners of Hobby Lobby, uh, to produce uh, all the evidence, all the, uh, all the documents relating to their use of birth control. Um, now, this is, uh, of course, a massive intrusion on privacy. Um, and those sorts of things are protected by medical privacy laws. But on the other hand, if you're going to claim that you sincerely believe that um, emergency contraception use is uh, a violation of your religion and the government is entitled to contest the sincerity of that belief, you can argue that that's a waiver. If you waive that claim, you've waived your medical privacy and the government is entitled to examine whether or not you live your life consistently with the uh, religious belief that you're arguing. Um, well, you, you know, you can, you can see where this would lead. It, uh, it, uh, uh, I would not want to see anything like that. And I think, worst of all, I mean, suppose the government did that, and suppose they found that one of the Greens' daughters, one of their teenage daughters, had an IUD, or that at one point they had, uh, they had bought emergency contraception. Um, I mean, it really misunderstands what religion is all about. Um, you know, I'm a Mormon, and, and, and I try to be pretty faithful, but as somebody put Robert Mueller on my life and tried to, you know, examine how well I had lived my entire life according to the precepts of Mormonism, they would find a lot of things, a lot of circumstances in which I fell short. I mean, that's what religion, uh, at least what Christianity is about, is we sin and we repent and we try and do better. And I can imagine circumstances in which a family that believes that emergency contraception is an abortifacient and the taking of human life, nevertheless under the pressure of a crisis, might make a decision uh, to use it and then later on would think that that, that was wrong. We shouldn't have done that. We knew better. Uh, we were taught better. And, uh, they consult with their ecclesiastical leaders, they repent, they resolve to do better, and they move on. But, you know, that's, it's easy to prove that they don't really believe emergency contraception, um, their beliefs about emergency contraception, unless their lives have been consistent in every respect. So, the bottom line here, I think, is that a sincerity is the only means of limiting religious exemption claims. The government is, first of all, unlikely to use it. But if it does use it, it would be a serious blow to religious liberty and would force believers to prove that their beliefs are rational and that they observe them with perfect fidelity. And uh, most believers can't, can't prove that, at least can't prove it honestly. I don't think that's a very good place to be doctrinally.
or politically or culturally. Um, doctrinally, uh, I don't think anyone can be trusted to be a judge in their own cause, and so it, it has to be the case that somehow the government should be able to review the existence of substantiality of a burden claim. It can't be the case that you prove substantial burden simply by alleging it. Um, I suppose another alternative would be to water down the compelling interest test to make strict scrutiny something considerably less strict. That's actually a danger that Justice Scalia warned against Employment Division versus Smith, and that's not a good idea either. I, th I think strict scrutiny means, needs to mean the same thing no matter when and where it's applied. Um, let me just, uh, in, in the remaining few minutes, uh, talk a little more broadly beyond REF, where I want to talk a little bit about Masterpiece Cake Shop. Um, Alexander mentioned this case. This is a case currently pending before the Supreme Court. Uh, it involves state action. It involves the Colorado Civil Rights Act, so REFRA doesn't apply to it, and Colorado doesn't have a Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so the believer in that case, the baker, um, had to make a compelled speech claim. And there's a line of cases where the government says, um, you're not required. The government can't make you say things. Uh, the government can't make you say the Pledge of Allegiance or can't make you say under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, for example. So that's, uh, that's his claim. His claim is that he can't make cakes for gay weddings because those constitute his endorsement of the wedding. Now, um, um, I, I know that all of you uh, are not Mormons, or maybe most of you are not Mormons, but this is Utah County, and I expect that you, like me, have been to scores of wedding receptions. Um, perhaps even during this calendar year, there are so many weddings going on in Utah County, and they all have a cake. And I have to confess, when I see a wedding cake, I don't hear it saying anything. But even if it were saying something, the one thing I'm certain it is not saying is, the baker congratulates the happy couple. Uh, the cake is not the speech of the baker. If it's speech at all, it's the speech of the parents, or the friends, or the couple, or whoever paid for the cake. It's not the baker's speech. What the baker is really arguing here is not that he's being forced to speak, but that he's being forced to use his talents and his services and his goods in support of activity of which he disapproves. And if there were a Religious Freedom Restoration Act in Colorado, that's exactly the claim he would make. And I think that's a dangerous claim. Um, I have a 1998 Jeep Cherokee. I love that car, um, but it's 20 years old and it has 200,000 miles on it and it breaks down uh, about every three months and, and my mechanic is a magician. He, uh, he gets on the internet, he finds parts that no one makes anymore and he fixes the car and, um, and in most cases he doesn't even bankrupt me uh, for what he charges. Um, should he have the right to refuse to serve people because they're Muslim or they're gay or they're Mormons or they're women or they're feminists or whatever? Um, now maybe if he were a church, in fact, certainly if he were a church, he would be able to do all of those things. Um, I don't know what the, the church of repairing 1998 Jeep Cherokees would look like, but if it were a church, he could do that. But he's a for-profit business in the public square uh, with a presumptive obligation to serve everybody. And I think that's important for all of us. No one should have to live in this country wondering if every time they walk into a store, they're gonna be humiliated and refused a good or a service because of who they are. And that's true even if you can go next door and buy the same thing. Um, 
I mean, in fact, it's the same principle as the one that Alexander mentioned, that the fact that there's some lot across town where you could build your church is not a justification for the city to tell you you can't build a church on the lot that you actually own. I think that's, uh, that's uh, I, I would call that a notion of, of equal citizenship, that we're all entitled to circulate in the public areas of our society and fulfill our legitimate and legal wants and needs without fear of being humiliated or rejected. Dignity or offense doesn't quite cover it. I think it's a matter of equal citizenship. Well, I've talked too long um, and uh, with too much animation as usual, usual, but I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Questions? I kind of dominated last time, but I'll uh, jump in and ask my question. Um, I, I'm a believer that we sometimes spend a little bit too much time parsing the Constitution and forget about the Declaration of Independence. And uh, the, the Ninth Amendment is maybe a hyperlink to the Declaration of Independence. Um, is it possible that we have just concentrated on the enumerated rights, and we have expanded this idea of rights a little bit too large. The idea being that I, I don't think that one man's rights, the fulfillment of one man's rights can infringe the rights of another person. And so when we say that I have a right to be served in a business, don't we all have a right to conscience, even if that conscience may be aberrant to another person? Does the public square, is the public square really a thing that if, I, if I'm out there and saying, I'm selling cakes, therefore another person can compel me to serve them? In other words, be their servant, be their business partner, be their contract partner, be, be, be an associate in business? I'll take a crack at that. That's a deep question of, of philosophy. It's a deep question of, of public policy. Uh, and reasonable people can, can disagree all over the place. Uh, the Declaration of Independence clearly set forth certain, uh, certain broad principles. Uh, I, I, I think I personally believe in those principles. How those principles are applied in the day-to-day -day, uh, give and take of an organized society uh, is actually a very difficult question. And those principles um, took shape in some instances in constitutional provisions that have actual words, they have a history behind them, they have some sort of an intent behind them, and they have limits. And that is what the law tries to deal with. So, as a, so you can raise matters of sort of philosophical, you know, how far should we go? How much should we make um, uh, part of the rights of citizenship? We can expand that idea all over the place. If somebody's holding a backyard party, um, and they invite all of the neighborhood except for one person. Is it a right of citizenship to be involved in that backyard party? Well, at the moment, most of us think no. But you can imagine a situation where people would think yes. So these, these lines that are drawn, uh, these lines that are often philosophical in nature, um, are, uh, you know, are challenging and they, they get into moral philosophy and so forth. But the law is, is the concrete version of, of that, of those compromises and, and those decisions that have been made. And so I don't actually find discussion of the Declaration of Independence terribly helpful in trying to figure out uh, what the religion clauses mean or what uh, you know, unreasonable search and seizure means. They're, they're sort of moral touchstones, but they don't tell me exactly how far to go or not to go. Where are these lines that, uh, that Fred was just talking about? Uh, ought to be drawn. Um, we can't have a purely absolute view of property and contract and association. Nor can we have a purely absolute view of civil rights and non-discrimination. Much of human interaction is discrimination, deciding who your friends are and so forth. So where are those lines to be drawn? Well, we've been, we, we the people are in the process of trying to figure that out. 
And, and sometimes we include new groups, and sometimes we say, no, that group doesn't need to be included in that particular protection. And we work those things out, and the Constitution provides a framework uh, for doing that. I, I, I agree with all uh, of what Alexander said. Uh, let me just add uh, one more point, and that is um, these, uh, how to work out conflicts of rights, it, it's always socially contingent. It, it depends on time and place. So from the medieval era into the early 19th century, actually um, most businesses had an obligation to serve you. Now, we, they didn't have the range of businesses in the 16th century that we have here, but if you showed up at, a, at an inn at dusk, they had to let you in. Because if they didn't, you would be beaten and robbed and killed by the outlaws outside. And uh, uh, people had obligations to transport you. They have special obligations to you while you were in their care, riding a stagecoach or later on a train or something like that. Uh, and then uh, a lot of that changed as the result of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Uh, by statute and often by common law, the southern states changed uh, those laws so that they didn't have to serve uh, newly freed slaves and other African Americans. And so then this, this idea of no shoes, no shirt, no service, my business is my private property, I can serve whom I please. I mean, that was an epic in the United States well into the 20th century. Um, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 changed some of that, although the, the definition of public accommodation in the Civil Rights Act is actually quite narrow. Um, I think what the Civil Rights Act ch changed over time were attitudes, that there arose an attitude that it's, it's simply wrong not to serve people on the basis of race. And actually, many people are surprised to learn that in their state, um, there is no prohibition on racial discrimination among customers. I think that's still true in Utah. Um, among customers? Customers. Uh, I don't think there's any protection against racial discrimination at the state level. I mean, if you go into Walmart, and for some reason, well, Walmart's a bad example because it's a national company, but if you go anywhere, any retail establishment, I do not believe they have a legal obligation to serve you. Uh, unless they fall under the Civil Rights Act or under right. the Utah Act, right. um, which are both pretty narrow. So I, I, I think this is, this is not a question of what the law is. This is a question of what kind of society we, we want to live in and, and, and how we should balance out these conflicts. And as Alexander says, the, these are deep questions and there are never any easy answers to them. I'd point out also some of that history of owning your inn back in the Middle Ages and obligations to the public had to do with the fact that the king authorized you to own that inn. And so you were subject to the state, and, and that was a state-granted royal charter, so to speak. Um, the American experience was a little bit different from that because we, we uh, came out and owned property in ways that perhaps had not been been owned under you know, under feudal laws and you know, and so forth. So you know the picture is complex, and it is a question of how we want to get along and how we want to treat each other. Um, in my view, there ought to be uh, there ought to be space, plenty of space, for for private decision making. But that can't be absolute, and it can't be absolute in zones where the government has regulated, um, you know, for for over a century quite quite rigorously. Businesses are not libertarian institutions. If anyone's here anyone here believes that they are, um, they're just not. You were regulated, you know, tell that to the IRS, tell that to the Department of Labor, tell that to OSHA, I mean, the, you know, the list is endless. Tell that to the EPA, they'll just laugh and throw you in jail if you don't comply with their stuff. So it, you're not a libertarian entity if you're running the local Dairy Queen, you're just not, in the same way that you might be if you're running, uh, you know, the local objectivist society club in which case you would have very, very substantial rights to uh, exclude others, you know, to, uh, you know, to limit who can come in and so forth. 
So I've been under the vague impression that the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, passed in the 90s was soon after um, overturned by the federal courts um, based on violation of the Constitution, maybe the Equal Protection Clause. So what I'm wondering if that's the case, how is it then that states are able to implement their own state level uh, legislation? Yeah, just really quickly, it was not overturned as a general matter. It was overturned because the Supreme Court held that Congress at the federal level did not have the power to impose that standard upon the states and that it had not sufficiently invoked whatever power it might have to impose that on the states. So it was not an equal protection issue. It was not some other limit. So RIFRA continued and continues to apply to the federal government to limit what the federal government can do. If the government comes after, if the IRS comes after you because of your religious beliefs, for example, to try to tax you in some special way, you can raise RIFRA as a defense to the IRS. Um, now, uh, when Congress sought to try to fix that, as I tried to explain, uh, the consensus had broken down over a number of these issues that we've been talking about, these civil rights issues and how much do we want religious freedom to be able to be a bar uh, against the application of civil rights laws, especially in some of these kind of quasi-public areas like employment, housing, and public accommodations. Now, I believe you mentioned that um, businesses are not necessarily libertarian institutions, and in the uh, case of the uh, wedding cake, um, say a mom and pop shop has a business, but it's just under the personal identity of the grandfather or so on, and a gay couple requests that they make a cake for them. Now, maybe it's not necessarily a, a matter of free speech, but could it be considered a matter of whether or not you have a right to, let's say, my labor and my, um, my works? That's the libertarian argument. Yeah, I, it. I, I, I would say no. I would say no for several reasons. First of all, we don't live in a libertarian society. This is not the state of nature. Um, uh, uh, it's not all I read. Yeah, that's right. Or John Locke, and, uh, or even Immanuel Kant. Um, we live in a social welfare society. As Alexander, I think, very well explained, uh, the baseline or the assumption since the New Deal is government regulation. Government regulation is the norm and exemption is the exception. So, so that, that's number one. But number two, um, this sort of underlines what I think is the problem with exemptions, and I mean a doctrinal problem. Um, I think a lot of exemptions are, are completely unproblematic. Virtually all the exemptions that Ms. Smith mentioned at lunch are fine. Um, and, you know, there, all of us can uh, make long lists of government bureaucrats acting stupidly, and there should be remedies against that. But if you were at lunch, you, you would have noticed that all the examples she listed entailed one of two circumstances. Either religion was being singled out for a burden that no one else had to bear. So in one circumstance, uh, you know, a guy wasn't allowed to, to sacrifice animals as part of his religious rituals, but butchers were allowed to butcher them, and hunters were allowed to butcher them, and all sorts of secular uses, uh, secular justifications for butchering animals were permitted, but not a religious one. I mean, clearly discrimination against religion. The other circumstance would, were cases in which there were uh, significant burdens on others who don't share the accommodated belief. I, again, I think the health insurance thing is, is a really interesting example. Who owns the health insurance plan? You know, The employers say it's their plan and that the government's messing with their plan. But the employees say it's their plan, it's part of their compensation, and that the employer is messing with their plan. Um, whose, whose plan is it? Well, there's, there's no natural law answer to that. It's, uh, 
It's who's ever planned the, the, the courts say it is. Um, but, but one thing is sure is that if Hobby Lobby's employees, or better, little sisters of the poor employees, most of whom are not Catholic, are denied uh, no cost coverage of contraception, they're being burdened. Um, they're suffering. Uh, they're bearing a cost in order to enable the little sisters of the poor to practice their religion. That just doesn't seem intuitively right to me, um, that we should be able to externalize the cost of practicing our own religion onto others who think differently. So, so here's where I'm going to disagree a little bit. Um, if, if all the government has to do to create the situation that Professor Geddes mentioned is to impose upon you a, an obligation to provide a benefit to somebody else, and if your objection to providing that benefit is automatic, automatically becomes a burden on that other person, um, that's a fairly expansive understanding of the word burden. Um, most employers do not have to provide health insurance. You have, to have a, you have to have 50 employees, if I remember correctly, before the obligation even kicks in. This isn't some kind of universal you know, you know, requirement. And it is an interesting proposition to say, again, you know, no obligation existed previously. Legislation has passed. Now you have an obligation to do something, to help someone else. And if you have some kind of a rights-based objection to that, it, it somehow is automatically um, uh, denied because someone who would benefit from your giving him something uh, gets to object and would be uh, you know, burdened uh, by you not giving it. Um, I think that's problematic. I think, I think the notion of burden has to be tied more tightly to common law harms or harms that are, that are, that are deeply rooted uh, you know, in the law. Uh, otherwise, you wind up with a, a really tricky situation. Um, I want to mention something else. Um, Professor Geddes uh, said that we live in uh, a society where government regulation is the norm. Um, I think the picture is a little bit more complex than that. That is certainly true of the business sector. It's certainly true of the marketplace. It's certainly true of housing, of employment. It's true of public accommodations like hotels and restaurants and, and common carriers like buses and trains and so forth. Um, it has not been true in many other areas of life. So for example, in the areas of sexuality, we've gone completely, completely the other direction, complete, almost complete deregulation, unless someone is getting physically harmed, you're dealing with children. Um, also, there, there's a whole realm of our society that is often referred to as civil society. It's not the marketplace, it's not the government, it's not the purely private zones within the home, which also are not subject to a lot of regulation, some yes, but not a lot. It's this area where people associate with each other on voluntary terms. In that area, we have preserved as a society, and I think for very, very good reasons, much more of the libertarian kind of ethic, the free association. You don't like my church? Good, go start your own. And that's that, that piece of American religious freedom has resulted in thousands and thousands of churches across the country. Um, you don't like my club? Well, I don't want you in my club. The guy says, fine, I will start my own. That happens all the time. That is the genius, one of the pieces of genius of the American society and, the, and, and of our great history is that we proliferate these voluntary associations and groupings. And I would be very, I'm very, very concerned that those areas where people have, have come to associate with each other in ways that are profoundly meaningful and allow them to live out their deepest values are becoming challenged. You're seeing this quite a bit in the area of religious education. Now, I know that the government is deeply invested in education. It, in, it inserts itself everywhere, and no one can resist government money. Um, but still, there's a price to be paid if we're going to say you take a penny of government money and you're a religious college, you suddenly have to comply with every conceivable regulation. You destroy the uniqueness of a BYU or a Biola or a Wheaton College and so forth. So I, I'm not willing to concede that just because there is lots of regulation that there ought to be, that, that we ought to simply um, agree to that and acclimate ourselves to that in every area of our, of our lives. It's not only areas of, uh, of sexuality where the government shouldn't be deeply regulating us. There are lots of other private associations outside of the marketplace where the government also should not be deeply intruding.
Hi. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, are we are we ending, or can I ask? Another no, you ask another question. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, then we will end. Okay. Um, my question was. Uh, based on some minor facts of the case that I would just like to see how both of um, you would address them from a legal perspective um, in regards to the Masterpiece Cake Shop. So, um, and this was based on, I read the document that Jack Phillips Masterpiece Cake Shop sent in to the Supreme Court. And one of the facts of the case was that it wasn't that he was flat out unwilling to provide services to same-sex couples. It was just that he wasn't willing to design a cake. Um, he was willing to provide any other pre-made, you know, bakery items that were there. It was just that he wasn't willing to use his, you know, artistic abilities that he believed God gave him to um, design them a cake. Um, and then the second uh, minor part that I'd just be curious what would be had to said in a, from a legal perspective would be after um, David and Craig left the Masterpiece Cake Shop, they went and found another cake, and that cake um, had, you know, had seven layers with the rainbow colored, uh, you know, each layer, and that, that's his political symbol, and if we don't know what the kind of cake would be that they would have asked Jack Phillips to make, but would that have been considered speech and uh, would Jack Phillips have the right to like object to that kind of cake specifically? Yeah. Um, well, we could we could make an even an even clearer example than than the rainbow. Um, See, a professor will always change the facts that you give. Him. <laughs> oh, is it that? I was about. To, I, I actually think the rainbow symbol is a little ambiguous because it's on Mormon primary books too, and, and I don't think it means the same thing that it means when it's on LGBT materials. But suppose they wanted a cake with a swastika. Um, uh, I, I don't know what I think about that doctrinally, but my intuition is that someone shouldn't be required to bake a cake with a swastika. Um, in terms of the facts of this case, um, the briefs tell different stories. Um, uh, Phillips makes the claim that, that you described, although in the opposition briefs, their story is that as soon as he found out it was a gay wedding, he said, I don't do gay weddings. And that was that. Um, and in the record, there's, there's, um, there's evidence that he refused even to bake cupcakes for a lesbian commitment ceremony, which of course, I don't know, maybe they were really fancy cupcakes, but you know, probably not designer cupcakes. Um, in terms of his God-given abilities and his artistic talents, I mean, I go back to my mechanic. Um, he has God-given abilities and artistic talents too. Um, my wife used to make quilts. Um, Craft is not speech. When someone deploys their craft, it's not necessarily the case that they're speaking. Uh, as far as the Supreme Court is concerned, you, you need two circumstances for it to be speech. Number one, the person engaged in the conduct has to subjectively intend it to send a message. So, you know, we can assume that Mr. Phillips intended that. But it also has to be the case that your average reasonable person on the outside would understand the message. And for there, I go back to wedding cakes, which I don't think talk. And if they do, people don't understand them as the speech of the baker, but rather as the speech of the sponsors of the wedding. Yeah, but you gotta be really careful. Because when you say that something is not speech, that's in the artistic realm, you're not just saying it for the people you don't like. You're not saying it for everyone. You're saying it for, you know, the Jewish baker, uh, you know, the Jewish sculptor, the Jewish whatever it may be that doesn't want to, you know, craft some um, Christian identity, Aryan nation sort of uh, symbol. Uh, in fact, it, 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 it looks like the, the Colorado authorities are going to be in trouble because they didn't apply this standard uh, in a consistent way. Um, when, when Donald Trump was elected, uh, Melania Trump, very beautiful woman, 
that any designer under normal circumstances would want to design clothes for on an international stage um, was told by a number of designers in very public ways that they would not design for her. That their work as a, as a designer was, was expressive, it was part of their, their art and so forth and that they would not lend their expressive talents to and their personal services to uh, Melania Trump because of what her husband represented. And they made a big splash of that. It was in the Washington Post and many other places. Um, do we want a society that, that, that says you can't do that? Um, you know, it, is that what we need to restrict and get rid of for a, a very small handful of individuals who have an issue with baking a cake or arranging flowers um, for same-sex weddings. There aren't many of those people around. Um, there, there, there haven't been that many cases. And what happens to them, it's kind of an interesting thing, what happens to them is they are massively vilified, attacked and denounced as, as bigots and intolerant. Their names are dragged through the mud. Uh, they lose customers. There are enormous social costs to doing it. Meanwhile, the couple that goes in and gets rejected becomes Facebook heroes and are celebrated. Now, I'm not saying there's not injury, um, but, but, but it may be that we don't want to distort what constitutes speech and what constitutes artistic expression and what constitutes uh, you know, being able to send messages through the mediums through which one works we may not want to con constrain that too much just to get at a few hundred evangelical and Catholic cake bakers across the United States. Because if you, if you do that, you're going to have to live with the standard. And that can come back to bite a lot of artists, tattoo artists. And I mean, the list goes on and on of the kinds of people where the government could essentially regulate. Because after all, if it's not speech, then it's just subject to government regulation. And we, we may not want to cross that line. I guess we'll see. I, I especially agree with, with the last uh, thing that Alex said. Um, I know Roth wants to end, and so this won't be long. Um, there's something weird about these wedding vendor cases. Um, the vast majority of people in the United States get married twice at most. And the most unsuccessful people at marriage in the United States only get married four or five times in an entire lifetime. And yet, we're fashioning rules for general interaction in society on the basis of these occasional commercial interactions. I mean, it's odd. Um, the other, the thing that might explain it, and maybe this would be a way to sort of take these cases and put them in their own category, is that Cakes are not religious anymore. Chairs are not religious. Flowers are not religious. Uh, most of what you see at a wedding reception is not religious. But traditionally, in the United States, and I think even today, a wedding still contains a component of religiosity. And so people are disturbed about being involved in a wedding in ways that they, I think, reasonably might not be disturbed in being involved in any number of other transactions. Like your Jeep Cherokee case. Yeah, exactly. Nobody defends that, and that yeah. personally never happens. There are Jeep owners who think it's a religion, although I'm not one of them. Um, <laughs> and so for both of those reasons, I, you know, it would certainly be wise for the LGBT movement to make these cases go away, because as Alexander says, the plaintiffs are always sympathetic. Even when they're gruff and impolite, like Mr. Phillips, he's still, I think, sympathetic. Um, and if we could maybe wall off wedding services uh, from something like uh, coverage of dependents and, and same-sex spouses, I mean, in, in health insurance, I mean, that really matters. Uh, you don't want an employer saying, it's against my religion to contribute a health insurance premium to a same-sex marriage and sort of implicitly endorse that. Now that, you know, that's a cradle-to-grave thing. That, that matters hugely in the United States. 
And to have that kind of question being decided by a baker who didn't want to make a cake, I mean, it's, it's really backwards. Can I say one more? <laughs> I agree with that. I think, I, th I agree completely. I think there ought to be, we ought to find a way to say that, 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 that marriage, involvement in marriage is, is just a different animal. Um, we're talking about a social institution that for centuries had deeply religious meaning. Um, maybe in the coming centuries it won't. Uh, more and more, you know, fewer and fewer people have any issue with this. We're talking about probably a, a, a group of people that's going to get smaller and smaller all the time. A little bit of discretion on the part of the LGBT community would go a long way toward not creating more victims um, on the other side of the ledger. And um, I think looking at it the way you just described, could be useful. I think that's an important insight. I'm going to respond just a little bit, and then we're going to close. And uh, I'll respond by taking the more libertarian position. I think what we've really done is we've sort of diminished uh, Mr. Phillips's claim. I, I mean, I think Brett's done that. He, he sort of, you know, this, is, this isn't really speech, this isn't really religion, this isn't really... He is very sincere about that. He's, he, he's suffering significant economic loss. And we're using the marketplace and the government both to say you're going to believe this way if you're going to participate. And if you're going to do that, at least compensate him under the Fourth Amendment for the taking of his, of his, of his, of his right, of his property. Give him something in return. I think what, that's what happens to often. I, I like this last discussion because we're trying to find ways to accommodate. I think, by the same token, my friends who, who claim that this gay marriage thing doesn't ma matter couldn't be further from. I, I think on that, Fred was right. He articulated it well. They only get married. They only want to get married once. It's the most important thing in their life, and that cake is a centerpiece of it. It's really important for them. We need to have a system that takes all of these seriously and doesn't deprecate any of it. Let me close with an example and a defense of why I think RIFA really matters. This is personal, and it has to do with an exemption. I uh, was the age of some in this room. I was 19 years old. We were in the there was that we, we were in a war in Vietnam. And I had to face the issue of whether I could, as a matter of conscience, kill another human being. And a system existed, an exemption system. We actually fought a war, an unpopular war, the Vietnam War with exemptions. They're not this thing to worry about. And so what happened was I thought it through and decided I could not. That it would not be true to myself or to the God I personally worship. I felt it would be wrong. So I was given an opportunity. Somebody had to determine whether I was sincere or not. And I had to go before a board. You'd think it was an awful board. The, the, the chair was a captain. Sitting to his right was the mother of someone who had she'd lost a son in Vietnam. It wasn't as if I was going before a tribunal that was going to be favor me. And I made my case as best I could for why, as a matter of conscience, I should be exempt. Now, I also said, I would be willing to serve as a medic or do something else. Find another, find a solution for me. Find another way I can do this. I will do it. But don't ask me to kill someone. And uh, the determination for me, you can say these things don't matter very much, but the determination for me, you didn't hold that letter in your hand. From that board, that either determined that I go to prison or my government recognized that 
I had a sincere belief that deserved to be protected. I opened it and I wept. My government said I mattered. They had provided me with a process. And then they had said to me I mattered. And I want that right for my children and my grandchildren. And in exercising it, I think we need to, whenever possible, find accommodations because the interests and rights on the other side are enormous. I knew I was largely taking, if I was exempt, someone else was going to be sent, and it was more likely that they were going to be poor and be a minority, and that bothered me as well it should. But I'm grateful we have RIFRA or something like it and a forum where we can raise these issues and then do our best to live up to that which is, I sort of go back to, to live up to our Constitution and Bill of Rights and the sacrifices entailed and making them available to all of us. It's been great to have two friends on this panel and to have all of you with us. And I'm sorry to force you to indulge me with that last reminiscence. Thank you all. Thank you.